Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the Critical Care Nurse. Today we're going to be going over endotracheal intubation and nursing's responsibility before, during, and after the procedure. So in terms of endotracheal intubation, it is a procedure by which a flexible plastic tube is uh, inserted through a mouth or um, either an air um, past the glottis and into the trachea so that we can maintain a patent airway for a patient. So now we're going to be going over reasons for endotracheal intubations, things as critical care nurses that we can do to prepare for it, and things that you have to do directly after um, endotracheal intubation. Let's get started. All right, so now we're going to be talking about the endotracheal intubation, also known as just intubation for short. Going to be going over... Um, First, the reasons um, why an endotracheal intubation is warranted. Many reasons that can happen um, in medicine, but I'm going to go over maybe like four or five of the big reasons why we will need to intubate a patient in the critical care setting. So the first thing is um, hypercapnic respiratory failure. So here the patient, although they can be satting 100%, they're just not um, ventilating appropriately, so they're not blowing off their CO2. We also have hypoxemic respiratory failure. Here the patient is unable to oxygenate and their O2 sats um, well, will be below 88% and that can be dangerous for an extended period of time. We also have the inability to protect airway. Reasons for this, um, if they have a weak or absent cough or gag. Also, an imminent surgical or invasive procedure. So if a patient is about to have surgery or have an invasive procedure and they're going to be under general anesthesia, we're going to want to take over their breathing and also their ventilation. Another reason is also inflammation of airway. Um, that can be seen for patients that have exacerbations of asthma. So there's actual mechanical um, blockage of uh, the airway, in which case we'd want to put an artificial one in. Now in terms of uh, being in the critical care setting, as nurses there's a, lot, um, a pretty big preparation game. It's actually not that big, um, but just small things that you can do to make it easier uh, for everybody. So the first thing you can do is you can pull out the bed. Um, make sure that your suction is set up and it's actually working. It's very important to have that. We have a dedicated medication line. Most intubations are going to be awake, but sometimes we're going to have to give them some sedation if they're fighting us. We want a dedicated line, normal saline for that. Also a towel roll that we can place underneath the neck to hyperextend so we can get a better view of the glottis. Endotracheal tube, endotracheal tube holder. Um, the cuff sentry, so we can continuously monitor um, the cuff pressure. Um, Ambu bag for uh, hyperoxygenating the patient before we actually intubate. Have respiratory grab the vent, put it in the room already. Have a 10 cc syringe that we can hook on to the pilot. Um, restraints. More often than not, patients are going to be restrained right after intubation. Also sedation, making sure that we have adequate sedation for the patient after they are intubated. Uh, make sure that we also have a presser on standby as um, they can go hypotensive. And also to increase the O2 sat volume um, so that we can hear if, they, uh, if their O2 sat starts to drop a little bit. Oh, don't mind the grandfather clock, so pull out the bed, suction, dedication, uh, dedicated medication line, towel roll, endotracheal tube, endotracheal tube holder, cuff sentry, ambu bag, vent, 10cc syringe, restraints, sedation, presser, and increase the O2 sat volume. Now directly after intubation, there are a few very important things that we need to do um, to finish up the whole process. The first thing we do once we are past uh, the glottis and in a good position is we are going to want to hear breath sounds bilaterally. After we're past the glottis and we're in a good position, we'll also want to attach the easy cap. 
after that we're also going to want to get a chest x-ray and then after that we're also going to want to check a cuff pressure at some point too this isn't directly in order but these are the four things we're going to have to do so breath sounds bilaterally if we only hear breath sounds on one side that means we have to pull back the endotracheal tube so that we're in a good position the easy cap is an end tidal co2 detector so um once it uh, or once you um, exhale and um, it has a lower pH, um, it'll see that uh, that there's CO2 and that there you'll see a color change in the actual device. Chest X-ray, we're going to want the angle tip five centimeters above the carina, and I'll show you that in a second. And then we also have to check the cuff pressure, make sure it's between 22 and 30 centimeters of water. So going over everything again endotracheal intubation reasons. We're going to have a hypercapnic respiratory failure, hypoxemic respiratory failure, inability to protect airway, imminent surgical or invasive procedure, and inflammation of airway. In terms of our prep game, we're going to have to pull the bed out, have suction, dedicated medication line, towel roll, endotracheal tube, endotracheal tube holder, cuff sentry, ambu bag, vent, 10 cc syringe, restraints, sedation, presser, and uh, increase the O2 set vol volume so that we can all hear and after intubations, um, or intubation, excuse me, breath sounds bilaterally, easy cap and color change, chest x-ray five centimeters above the carina, and cuff pressure 22 to 30 centimeters of water. All right, my fellow nurses, here we have a standard eight centimeter endotracheal tube. Different parts of the tube, we have the angled tip right here, we have the cuff itself, we have the markings, so right here we have an eight centimeter tube, and we're usually going to want at the lip for the tube to be at 22 and 26 centimeters. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, but for most patients, we're gonna want it between 22 and 26. But what we really want is we want the tip here to be five centimeters above the carina, which can only be verified um, with an X-ray. Going back to the parts, we have a standard 15 millimeter connector. We also have the pilot tube and the pilot balloon and uh, we have a 10 cc syringe. So what happens is, you know, when we intubate the patient and we are past the glottis and we're roughly about five centimeters above the carina, um, the respiratory therapist will take a 10 cc syringe and start filling the cuff with atmospheric air through the pilot balloon. So here we have the first 10, as you can see the cuff is inflating. Second 10, and we're just gonna do it to 25. So once again, we usually want the cuff um, between 22 and 30 centimeters of water. Um, this will allow us to completely occlude the trachea so that we can administer positive pressure through the ventilator and uh, not have the air just go out. So this will actually occlude everything. So um, everything is just going to be going through the tube here. So once the tube is in, we're past the glottis, the cuff is inflated with a syringe um, connected to the pilot balloon. Like once again, I said the respiratory therapist is going to do that. Um, and we hear a breath sound bilaterally. We're actually going to then take the endotracheal tube holder and connect it to the patient. So the different parts here, we have the two parts here. So we take the tape off the backs of these, and this is the part that actually goes onto the patient's cheeks. And uh, once it's... Uh, you can actually put your hand over here to kind of keep it soft so that it kind of melts onto their cheeks. And we also have the teeth here that dig onto the top of the endotracheal tube. Um, the teeth actually aren't long enough to actually puncture the tube, um, so that shouldn't be a problem. Not that it can't be, but I've just never seen that happen. So when the patient is intubated, we're going to have the one person holding it. Um, so we dig the teeth on top, take the strap here, wrap it all the way around and all over the top and then we snap it home and now that tube is not going to be going anywhere and uh, from the front that's yeah, let's do it like this from the front that's what it's going to look like and then we also have the wings here uh, in which we can actually depress and we can move the tube depending if we want to insert an uh, orogastric tube in as well um, so that's everything with the endotracheal tube and also the endotracheal tube holder and all the different parts. All right, so I actually just wanted to share a few personal experiences with intubations that actually helped make me a better nurse, but they're kind of horrible 
horrible situations to be in. Um, so one time I was actually, um, actually had a fresh heart um, that came out maybe an hour before I got on shift. And um, I think the unit was packed. We had a lot of really sick people. And it was when I was still pretty new to the intensive care unit. And uh, what happened is um, I was getting my patient ready, you know, doing my assessment and everything. And all of a sudden my charge nurse is like, hey, you're getting a train wreck coming from the floor. Um, they're going in a four. And I was like, oh, okay. So as soon as he actually told me, the patient, I saw them rolling down. And it looked bad. The patient was like vomiting all over the place, was on 100% um, oxygen. And uh, just wasn't looking good. Still talking and still uh, mentating somewhat appropriately. But it looked like uh, he had a compromised airway. So what happens is, uh, you know, we brought him into the room. And the anesthesia team was there already. And they said, we need to intubate this patient right away. Because while he had... Um, a mask on he was already like vomiting into the mask but it sounded like he was still kind of protecting his airway but he might have already aspirated a little bit so in any case you know we dropped the bed down and it was really uh, kind of stressful um just because you know i we had no time to prepare so there was actually nothing in the room i didn't know that at the time there was like nothing prepared because a patient had just left a few hours earlier and had just been cleaned so no one really set up the room with the appropriate appropriate um suction and everything so what happened is um you know when we brought the patient down to intubate apparently the light on the, the laryngoscope wasn't working and not only that we just didn't have suction so what had happened is the patient was completely down we had the laryngoscope in the light wasn't working um but i mean uh, i think he still kind of could have kind of seen uh, a little bit of something, but what had happened is the patient ended up vomiting while he was flat with a laryngoscope going directly, um, you know, p you know, past epiglottis into the glottis, and I think the patient just aspirated a violent amount um, of gastric content, and you know he was saying suction, suction, and there was no suction in the room, and it was a really bad experience. Um, and I think the patient uh, ended up um, going into ARDS and ended up dying a few days later. And that was just a really horrible um, kind of experience to go through. But then it kind of also prepared me that no matter what, if you have a patient, you're also open to admit, make sure that the room is pristine and ready. Because even at that point, um, you know, this, the room wasn't ready and the laryngoscope went out. And, you know, honestly, the patient still was protecting his airway, but um, in any case, it was just a lot of bad things that happened in a short amount of time and they all happened in concert to unfortunately lead to a patient death. Uh, another thing that I highly advise you to do um, when you're going to be intubating your patient is to already talk to the doctor and kind of have a game plan for what you want to do in terms of uh, keeping the patient adequately sedated. Um, so when I have a patient that is about to be intubated, I always make sure to talk to the doctor. I always have a um, order for a presser to make sure that we maintain um, adequate MAPs during intubation and after intubation, and also um, adequate sedation. So we usually do um, opioid analgesic and a sedative hypnotic, so we'll have fentanyl and propofol. Um, more often than not, I'm not going to know how the patient is going to respond um, to the fentanyl and propofol, so that's why I always have a bag of Levo ready. So, you know, we'll intubate the patient, um, we'll uh, get the chest x-ray and um, make sure everything is good to go. And I'll already have the fentanyl and propofol hanging wide together, and I'll also have the Levo on standby. So as soon as the patient's intubated, um, I'll hook up uh, the fentanyl and prop and kind of let that run in a low dose and see how the patient uh, responds to that. And as long as they're comfortable and not bucking the vent, um, that's kind of the settings that I'll keep it at. Okay, guys, so one thing that I also uh, just absolutely implore you to do is to not forget about the patient when we're intubating them. Um, and by that, I mean, don't stop talking to them. Because a lot of times, um, you know, when we have to intubate a patient, it's going to be a very stressful and emergent situation. And um, I remember one time we were, uh, one of my uh, one of the charge nurses' patients um, started to go down, it became hypotensive. So I jumped on the chest, I was doing some beast mode compressions. And uh, while we were doing compressions, we were having to intubate the patient. Um, oh man, this critical care resident was like a total baller. Um, so I was doing compressions and I looked at her, I'm like, hey, do you want me, to, I was about to say, hey, do you want me to stop so you can um, intubate? So as soon as I pushed down and lifted up, she was just like, whoop, in 10 cc syringe, uh, filled it up, and uh, we had an airway. And I was just still doing compression. I was all like, damn, that was gangster. Holy crap. That was awesome. But then um, after that, after we were doing, um, you know, my round of compressions, the patient started to wake up. And now she woke up. Her chest is hurting. I'm, like, pounding on it. 
and um, now she has a breathing tube in, and no one was saying anything to her, so um, I actually had taken care of her like a few weeks earlier, and I was just saying, hey, how are you doing, honey? Like, um, we're going to take care of you. We're going to take really good care of you. You know, uh, you just need a little bit of help. Um, you'll be okay. So it's just important to make sure that you still talk to the patients. And remember that after intubation, um, sometimes, and especially if it's an awake intubation, well, that was kind of a gray area because she was kind of out. And then I was doing compressions, we intubated, and she kind of came back too because she was actually getting perfusion um, to the brain. So it's just important to make sure to talk to the patients and make sure to comfort them and to um, make sure that they know that you're there for them and that you're doing uh, everything that you're supposed to do to make sure that they get the best care possible. Thank you for watching. I hope I was able to help in some way, shape, or form, and if I did, please subscribe. Once again, thank you for watching The Critical Care Nurse save some lives.